We're going to receive our tithes and offerings. Uh, Charlie and Steve, if you'll come, please. Let's join together in prayer. Charlie, would you lead us, please? I was too pleased for the morning to sing and praise you. The Lord, amen. Amen. Thank you, Charlie. This morning, as I uh, share with you, I uh, thought I'd start off uh, two or three different things. One, uh, uh, a couple praise reports. Uh, of course, this week was a really a crazy week. I, uh, it seemed like it was hospital week. Uh, uh, I'd uh, spent Monday uh, uh, in Mount Vernon, uh, 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 sitting with Jack Struck, uh, Scott's dad, and and. Uh, uh, he wasn't doing very good at all, and they ended up moving him from Mount Vernon Hospital to St. Louis Hospital, and so he's been in the St. Louis Hospital all this week, and, and of course, family had been, has been going on for a couple of weeks, and so we've had, our house has been kind of like Grand Central Station with uh, the kids coming in and, and going out and, and uh, doing that, and uh, so Tuesday... Uh, my brother called, and he said, uh, the ambulance is on its way to the, uh, the manor. Uh, uh, my Aunt Frances, uh, who I lived with by my two, they said that she's uh, uh, really sick. And so uh, I changed clothes because I'd been working out in the yard, running in the shower. And he called me back, and he said, don't go to Pinkneyville Hospital. We're going straight to Carbondale. So we, I take off to Carbondale, and I get home about... 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, uh, uh, we stayed with her, and they couldn't make up their mind exactly. The, met with the surgeon a couple of times. He said, we need to do surgery, but she's 96 years old. You know, uh, your family's going to have to make a decision, but we're going to keep her sedated and, and uh, uh, come back. So uh, Wednesday then, we spent all day Wednesday, and about uh, 8 o'clock Wednesday night, they decided they didn't have any other choice. They had to operate. And uh, the surgeon, really a nice young man, he come in and he said, I'll just be honest with you, she's 96 years old. You know, uh, I, I, I think the, the blockage is serious. Uh, it may take me two to three hours, and if the longer the surgery goes, the less likely sh she'll make it. So at 8 o'clock on Wednesday night, they started that surgery. We'd been there all day. And so Jim and I and uh, our cousin Jackie, we decided we'd, step out because he, he told us it's going to be you know two to three hours that we'd get us something to eat so we went to the restaurant and just got our order and the hospital called and said the surgery was over and we thought there's no way and, and you know and they and they said the surgeon is waiting to see you and so we rushed back to the hospital 35 minutes and that surgeon when he come out he's a young man a, a neat guy he come out and he said i explained it this way he said when i went in and i saw what it was and i realized i could fix it in a few minutes i'd done a high five <laughs> 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 and, and he said i could not have asked for a better scenario when i got in there and so uh here we went in to see her and she was alert talking to us felt much better you know of course she was under you know the you know but, uh, you know, that's a miracle, guys. I, I, I just, you know, uh, we, we left going to get something to eat because we'd been there all day. And I, I think I, my, my Cheerios had really wore out. <laughs> and uh, uh, so uh, we were so thankful. While that was going on, Jim Williamson over here was having his surgery on Thursday. And so I sat with Judy. I'd run back and forth between my family and, and Judy's. And, and uh, uh, it was kind of, I, I called Carolyn once because they, they took Jim in at 10 o'clock and said it would be a couple hours. And uh, uh, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, he was still under surgery. 
3 o'clock, he was still. So I called Carolyn. I said, Carolyn, you better pray. I don't know what's going on, but this thing's going on way too long for Jim. And, and so anyway, uh, 5 o'clock, they finally in that, uh, that told, called and said that uh, uh, the surgeon would meet with them. And, you know, thank the Lord. Uh, it was complicated, but he come out of that thing. Everything was just fine, you know, and uh, I was down yesterday and visited with him, and he uh, was uh, getting uh, ready. No, it was, it was Friday night I went, wasn't it? Because he went home yesterday morning. Yeah. And, it, and so he, he's home and going through recovery, and, and uh, uh, God's good, amen? And, and a lot of complicated things. Jack, we got word last night that Jack was improving, and uh, uh, they was able to, uh, the big question on Jack was whether they could do the dialysis, and they've got him in St. Louis, and uh, was able to do twice now dialysis, and he's starting to respond really well. So God is good. It, it, it complicated week, but, you know, praise God. God is a, a, a does just what he, he's good at, miracles and, and sufficient grace. Amen? So this morning I, I want to share with you, and uh, let's see if I'm ready to, to do something, Larry. I'm not, uh, I don't have a, all right, let me see. I got green lights, but nothing is, uh, I pushed every, there's four buttons and I pushed them all. <laughs> <laughs> Want me to turn off and try again? Okay, I'll, I'll switch that. Aha. Hit the right button. <laughs> okay. Uh, whoops. Now it went. Okay. Uh, take your Bible and, and turn to 2 Corinthians. Huh. It's one of the. I got the auto advance on PowerPoint. Uh, have I done that? or? Oh, wow. Well, you can look at all my slides and we'll pray and go home. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I didn't do that, Larry. Okay, forget my, just take my slides off, uh, Larry, uh, and, uh, and uh, but l let me share these passages of scripture, and, uh, uh, and we'll uh, talk about them. Uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And then Isaiah 40, 31, it says, But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And uh, I, the Isaiah 40, 31, the word wait means to trust with expectancy. Okay, And to renew your strength, it means to exchange your weakness for his strength. How many realize that's a pretty good trade? And that you come to realize that God, he so loved the world that he made a way through his son Christ Jesus that we could exchange our sins for his righteousness. That's a pretty good trade. And so what I want to share with you is the great exchange is trading my sorrows. Now, what I did, I, I got us a, a video that I want us to, to uh, do together, and it's a song, Trading Our Sorrows. I, I chose the person to do the song because we've had the young man on a video before that's blind and has all the handicaps. Uh, I, I want you to realize as this young man sings this song, he knows a lot more than what you and I know about a relationship with God. And I hope I can unfold that to you as we talk about making exchanges. Because here is a young man who is blind, was born blind, a young man who has all kinds of physical problems, and yeah, he is making the most out of his life. And he is trading his sorrows for the strength of the Lord. So, uh, Larry, can you put that up for me? And uh, this stand together while we do this, if we, let, if we can uh, 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 do our, our video. A and I want you to listen to this and sing along, okay? Okay. 
Everybody knows this song. If you guys want to stand on up, we have two hand motions for you. A thumbs up is a yes, and an L shape with your hands is a Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. I'm treating my sorrow, I'm treating my shame. I'm treating my shame. I'm laying it down for the joy of the Lord. I'm treating my sickness. I'm treating my guys. Hmm. Well, I wanted to use that CD or that video because the joy of the Lord is my what? My strength. And I think as we go through life, how many believe that there's all kind of impossible situations that you face as you go through life? There's all kinds of uh, difficulties that you encounter as you go through life. How many realize there, there's many people have broken relationships? 
There's many people who have difficulty in relationship. There's people to get angry. You ever get angry? You ever get frustrated at yourself for being angry? And then sometimes you think, Lord, it's impossible. I can't control my anger. I get frustrated. You know, or God tells you to love somebody, and you say, oh, I can't love that person. They're impossible to love. It's an impossible relationship. And I want you to understand, as you go through life, you know, there's going to be a lot of areas of impossibility. But if you will allow God to develop a faith in you, you can trade your impossible situation for the strength of the Lord. That you can make an exchange and realize God is there to help. I want you to understand, Rena shared this video. Here's a young man that's never been healed, but look at the joy of the Lord in this young man. He is making the most out of a difficult situation, and God's grace is sufficient in his life. And he's touched multiplied thousands of people because of his stand of experiencing the joy of the Lord in an impossible situation. And so here we are, as we go through life, we get encountered with a, a difficult situation, and if we focus on the situation, guess what? We get discouraged, we get depressed, we get defeated, we get aggravated, we get agitated, and sometimes we cry out, God, where are you in all of this? When all of a sudden we need to have a wake-up call and realize, hey, if we look to him and we look with expectancy, God can give us strength to help us in our weaknesses. God can give us strength to help us go through a difficult time. So I want you to think about this as we do this message. I love what A.W. Tozer said. He says, we have to switch from our little human battery to the infinite power of God. <laughs> Isn't that a pretty power? That we need to make that switch. But how many realize that switch is very difficult? But yet, as you go through the scriptures... And these passages of Scripture that, that God exchanged, God loved you, and he sent his son to exchange our sin for his righteousness. That he loved you so much that he died on the cross to pay for the penalty of our sin. Aren't you glad we can make that exchange? Aren't you glad that even as we come to Christmas, that we are mindful that God loved us, that he sent his son, and his son came in a manger. He didn't come riding on a white saddle. He came born in a manger. And yet he came for one purpose, to go all the way to the cross of Calvary, to die on the cross of Calvary, to pay the price for the sins of all mankind. And when we receive him, we can exchange our sins for a right relationship with Jesus Christ. And how many realize that becomes a journey of faith that as we live our lives and the end, the end run, what is the end run? Heaven. Wow, how many of you realize? You know, sometimes, and I, I, I thought about this quite a bit. Do you realize that our ultimate goal is heaven? That our ultimate relationship, as sin and then was talking about, one day he's coming again. That'll be his second advent. But you know what? He's coming for people who long and expect for his return. He's coming for people who have a trust and expectancy that one day, no matter how difficult life may be here on earth, it's going to be glorious up there. I always think about this when I preach funerals. And when I deal with people who have sorrow and, and they've had great loss in their lives and it's, it's, oh, the pain and the agony of that is unbelievable. But do you realize that when we have a relationship with Jesus that is actually stepping out of a sin-sick world into a glorious world that has no more pain, no more suffering, no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more death, no more dying. Wow, isn't that the ultimate goal? Isn't that the ultimate direction that we need to be looking for? Matter of fact, I, I love this missionary. And this missionary was working in Indonesia. And he was working with a, a, a very difficult tribe. And this missionary finally got permission that he could live with the tribe. They didn't know whether they liked the missionary, but they said, okay, if you live with us, you, you can live with us. And so for two years, this missionary lived with this tribe. And one day, the chief sat down with him. And he says, I'm going to give you permission to preach the gospel to my tribe. And the missionary said, well, you know, why is that? And he said, because I've washed you. And he said, we have some of the same rules that your Bible does. 
But our tribe can't live to it. We're always falling short. We're always making mistakes. We're always missing the mark. But I have watched you for two years, and you have lived your Christianity. I want to know more about it. And he said, what's the difference? And he says, because my God lives in my life, and he gives me strength to be an overcomer day by day. He gives me the ability to live a Christian life. That's the exchange, guys. And that's what that, in, that chief, and that's what that village experienced. And so for the next six months, they had revival in that village. Can you imagine? Simply because a missionary allowed God to give him the ability to live the Christian life, to be an example, to demonstrate a Christ-like lifestyle through the difficulty, through the, the problems, he was still victorious in Christ. How many realize that's the way we ought to be living? That's the exchange that we need to make uh, within our lives. Now, I want you to think about this. My favorite passage of Scripture is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. That's the difficult phrase, okay? But acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will direct your path. Now, I want you to understand something about that. It says that you have to trust in the Lord. You see, it says those that wait, those who trust with expectancy, okay? You have to trust in the Lord. But you see, where we run into difficulty is, is we try to work it out. We get in the flesh. We want to make it successful. Because I read this thing, and I, I thought this was pretty uh, outstanding to me. It says, man is a barn cobbler. Cobbler? Shoe cobbler, all right? What does a shoe cobbler do? He repairs shoes, doesn't he? And so he says, man is born as a cobbler. He wants to fix everything. Man wants to repair everything. You see, you think about this in life. And I thought this was pretty powerful as you think about man as a cobbler because, you see, here's what man wants to do. I'll use Jerry. He improves cattle by breeding. He wants to make it better. A man, he wants to streamline cars and airplanes to make them better. He's trying to fix it, make it better. You see, health-wise, we want to diet, we want to have vitamins, we try our best to make our bodies better. Yeah. And then you see a Dairy Queen commercial, and you forget the diet and the vitamins and all of that, okay? We want to make people better, so we educate. Education is the answer. Educate, train, develop. Man is always trying to make himself better, but God says, my ways are higher in your ways. My ways are better in your way. I'll make you a new creation. I'll make you a brand new person. The Bible says, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says old things, the old cobbler way is passed away, and guess what? I make you a new creation in Christ, and then that is a journey that you learn to make an exchange. You exchange your ways for God's ways. You exchange your abilities for God's way. Let me tell you what. It is the very thing that has defeated most Christian people because the Bible says don't walk in the flesh, but walk in the Spirit. And guess where we walk most of the time? We walk in the flesh, and we get in the flesh, we get frustrated, we get upset, and we get mad at God, we get mad at people, we get mad at circumstances, we look for an answer, and the answer is right before our very eyes is God is the answer. Can I hear an amen out of that? And it's called the exchange life. I exchange my sins for his gift of righteousness. I exchange my weaknesses for his strength. Now think about this passage of Scripture in 2 Corinthians 12, uh, 9 through 10. I've always had trouble with this passage of Scripture, but it makes more sense to me today than I, don't, I can't explain when. But here's what it says in 2 Corinthians 12 and, he, uh, and verse 9. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Now let that, I want you to understand. His grace is sufficient for what? For each one of us, okay? And here's what he says. And my strength is made perfect in weakness. 
Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproach, and in need, in persecution, and in distresses. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, I am strong. How many of you believe this young man, God is made strong? How many of you believe that in his weaknesses, God's grace has been sufficient for him? How many of you realize this young man can stand up blind and has all kind of handicaps, and yet he can stand up and sing the joy of the Lord? Now, where is the church at most of the time? If we're in sickness, we're mad. If we're in sickness, we're wondering where God's at. If we're in sickness or we have problems, we're looking for God. When we need to open our eyes and realize in our weaknesses, if we'll acknowledge him, he'll be there with sufficient grace. That's where the church has missed it. We get caught up and think everybody ought to be healed. Yes, my God is a healer. But if he doesn't, it's not because somebody is not lacking faith. They may, may be experiencing more faith than we've ever dreamed because God is helping them in their weakness. When a young man can stand up and sing the joy of the Lord, I'm trading my sorrow, I'm trading my pain. He has traded it, guys, and he's experienced more grace than we can imagine. We need to get our eyes off of the difficulties. You see, we're cobblers. We're trying to fix everything. I've been guilty as guilty of that. I want to fix everything. Matter of fact, I think somebody told me that not too long ago. They said, you're Mr. Fix-It. You want to fix it. I do. I want to fix everything. But you see, I've got to depend on God. How many realize he's not a fixer? He's a healer. He's a, a strength. He's an ability to help you through your most difficult times. Does that make sense to you guys? And, and, and I want you to understand as we go through this, Paul discovered that. He says, man, I can be happy in distress. I can be happy in a shipwreck. I can be happy... In the most difficult time, because I realize even in those difficult times, God is my strength, and God will take me through it. God will give me the ability to be an overcomer. What do you think about this? Now, let, let me give you an illustration while we're talking about Paul. Paul, who was known as Saul to start with, what did he do to the Christians? Persecuted them, killed them, had them arrested. They laid Stephen's coat at his feet while he watched him stoned to death. I mean, if you watch the movie, uh, the, what is it, the A.D., whatever, uh, 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 it shows Paul is this very passionate man, this man who was hell-bent on destroying Christians, this man who went to the extreme to destroy life, hated it with a passion. But on the road to Damascus, he encountered something. God appeared. Jesus appeared to him and said, Saul, you're fighting against me, and you're not going to win. You're fighting against the person you really need to know. And Paul met Jesus Christ on that road to Damascus. Do you realize that there was an exchange that took place? There was an exchange. Paul's life was changed. Paul's life was exchanged for the passion of hatred and bitterness and death and dying to a man who had a zeal for life, who had a passion to share Christ. As you read the story, something I missed, the the people were amazed after Ananias came and laid hands on him, and his sight was restored. They were amazed because he immediately wanted to go and preach Jesus. And they were amazed at his ability to preach Jesus. Do you realize that was an exchange? Do you realize that all of a sudden a person's life was transformed and he became a new creation in Christ Jesus? Amen? Now think about this. Then Paul, his passion and his revelation of what God had done in his life began to motivate him, and guess what? He preached the gospel at whatever cost. He paid the price for whatever cost it was. He was willing to go nonstop sharing the gospel of Christ. Now, can you imagine? Here we are. We're getting ready to start the Advent season, and the Advent talks about the first coming. Aren't you glad he came? Okay. But now 
here we are in the year 2016. Guess what? We're talking about Advent, him coming again. Okay? And we're talking about one day Jesus may come again. But Jesus, we mentioned, he's coming for a church who's longing and looking for his return. Can I hear an amen out of that? Now, here's what I want you to understand. What would the world look like if you and I lived our lives for God, one, with revelation, knowledge, truth revealed that sets us apart from the sin-sick world? That we exchange God's power and his revelation, knowledge, and his truth. And the Bible says, you'll know the truth, and the truth will do what? Set you free. You'll know truth. Isaiah 59 Verses 8 and 9, I think, verses 8 and 9, it says, my ways, meaning God, are better than your ways. Can I hear an amen out of that? My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. In other words, how many realize God's got a better plan, a, a better way? And here's the thing about it is, we need to start allowing God to take the word of God and quit trying to be argumentative over the word, quit trying to defend the word, quit trying to prove our point in the word, and let God's word come alive to you that it becomes revelation knowledge that you learn his ways and that you learn his ability and that you begin to think his thoughts and that you begin to move in his direction. And that's exactly what happened to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul forgot all about all of his education. The Apostle Paul forgot about all of his ability as a Sanhedrin priest. And he began to operate in the revelation knowledge of God. And it changed the whole known world. I mean, it turned the world upside down for the Lord Jesus Christ. But you see, what would happen to our world if we begin to allow God to reveal truth that sets us apart, that gives us the ability to not operate in our strength, but the strength of the Lord? Now, number two, what if we had a passion as Paul had for sharing the gospel to Christ? Listen, I love this definition of passion. It says, when you put more energy into something than is required to do it, it is more than just enthusiasm or excitement. Passion is ambition that is materialized into action to put as much heart, mind, body, and soul in something as possible. Can you imagine if the church got that passionate about the gospel? That we would put all our energies and all our resources and then realize that God has better and we take his strength and we move in a direction. Can you imagine? I, I'd say that we'd evangelize in America in two or three months. I'd say we'd turn the world upside down in a few months. But you see, it takes that kind of, of revelation knowledge. It takes that kind of passion. And then do you realize that Paul operated under the power of God and it was a life-changing, transforming power? that begin to flow out of him like rivers of living water. And isn't that what the Bible says? That when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, that you'll have rivers of living water that flow out of you, and it's life-giving water. Isn't that kind of what the Scripture talks about? And so what I want you to think about, that we can make an exchange. And I, I thought about this. Exchange my weakness for sufficient grace. I can exchange death for life because the moment you receive Jesus Christ into your heart, guess what you've done? You've received the gift of eternal life. Pretty good exchange. I can exchange my fears, my anxieties. I can exchange all the things that trouble me for his peace that passes all understanding. Amen? The list could go on and on of the exchanges that you and I can make or we can continue to be cobblers that's a choice you can continue to say i'll fix it i'll work it out or you can make a decision to say i can't i surrender i need help i need strength i need to make an exchange those are decisions that you know you and i have to make and here we are at advent and you know i had that Waiting and faith go hand in hand. How many of you agree with that? And it's interesting. Psalms 27, 14 says, Wait for the Lord 
and be strong and courageous. And you know what the word wait there is the same word that you find in Isaiah 40, 31. Those who wait and trust with expectancy. Here we are at Advent. How many of you realize that when the angel appeared to Mary and said you're going to have a child, she didn't have it the next day? Guess what she had? She had to wait. Is that not true? If you go through the scriptures, you'll find that many times God spoke, but it didn't happen overnight. How many of you realize we do the three kings and we talk about that, but when they had that revelation, the baby wasn't on their doorstep. Is that not true? They traveled miles, and they traveled miles, and they traveled miles, and they had to wait to see the promise. Is that not true? I mean, you can go through and through, and you'll find that many people had to go through a wait. Gosh, I remember. You remember being a kid? <laughs> That's a, huh? Been a while. And somebody asked me, they said, how's the church doing down at Ava? I said, well, we're there. And they said, well, how old are the people? And I said, just like me. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 they said, well, you got any young people? And I said, just like me. But, you know, isn't it amazing, guys, that as you go through the Scripture and you think about it, there's waiting. And, and, and remember as a kid? I mean, I remember as a kid. I didn't sleep on Christmas Eve. I wanted to know what was under the tree. I got caught a few times trying to get there a little early. But you know what? You had anticipation. You, you, you know, you didn't sleep. You was restless. You know, and... and uh, uh, it's, it was a waiting process. But you see, what God is saying, if you'll have a weight that has trust and expectancy, that it builds within you and he strengthens you and he'll bring it forth at the right time. And I want you to think about that because here we are. We're celebrating Advent 2016. And I love this passage of Scripture. It says, these all died in the faith not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. Hebrews 11, the faith chapter of the Bible. How would you like to be in that situation? They all died in the faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off, they were assured and they embraced. I want you to understand something about these people. I love Hebrews chapter 11, but you know, when you read Hebrews chapter 11, everything didn't turn out real good. Everything wasn't bright and shiny. They died in the faith. They suffered in the faith. They endured in the faith. They found sufficient grace to help them in their most difficult times. They found strength that they knew nothing about in the natural. And so what it says, they had a revelation they, they, they saw the promise. And that revelation knowledge, it said it brought assurance to them. They embraced it. You know the picture of embracing that I always see in that? It's like holding a little baby. And, man, you've waited, but you've received that, and you love that baby. Last night I was coming back from Carlisle. I told Carolyn and I, I made a dumb decision. All of us did. There was four of us. We decided we was going to stop after the ball game and get something to munch on, and I got a great big Diet Coke. I made a lot of stops. Or, uh, uh, <laughs> okay. But when I went in the, the convenience store, as I opened the door, they was the cutest little three- or four-year-old girl standing there. And... Uh, uh, I told Carolyn, I said, they, they were a, of some kind of Asian nationality, you know. And she had the blackest eyes and the blackest hair you'd see and the biggest smile on her face. And I stepped in there, and there she stood. And she said, look what I'm doing. <laughs> I look around because, you know, you, and the, her dad and mom was running the, the convenience store. 
And so I knelt down and I said, what are you doing? She said, well, come and look. I'm, I'm decorating the Christmas tree. And so I for all got about all that and, and I, I, I went with her and, and as she was showing her ornaments and then it dawned on me, you know, I better look around and find out where dad and mom's at. And, you know, here's this stranger come in there and I'm kneeling down at the Christmas tree with her. And, and so her dad comes and I, I look up at him and I said, oh, she's a cute little uh, uh, gal. And he smiled. So I went on. Well, then I come back. She was waiting for me. I guess I, was, I paid more attention to her than anybody and, and, and we had the best time, and I, I thought as I went to my car, what a wonderful thing to be a little child like that. And, and, and her mother come up, and she said, oh, my little girl loves to talk. <laughs> and, and, and yet, this is what I'm talking about, how precious that was. But their faith became precious. They, was assured, they embraced that just as much as enjoying that little girl and loving that little girl. I told somebody the other day they was talking about having a grandbaby, and they said the grandbaby was two, and I said, oh, man, I said, that's a precious time. That's a wonderful time. I said, enjoy every moment of it. I remember when my oldest grandkids were that age, we played the Good Samaritan, and I was the wounded stranger. They bandaged me up so much that I couldn't even get up. They had me wrapped up with sheets and bandages and and and. and I mean, we had a barrel of fun. Those were precious. And I want you to understand, they were assured. They embraced that. I mean, it was as much as playing the Good Samaritan and them with their children. And you know what else? Not only that, that was the force in their lives. And even through the difficult times, they still embraced. They died in the faith, and yet they held to that. I want you to understand, guys, you need to hear this. You need to embrace the faith, and you need to put a trust in God with expectancy that whatever situation you're in, he is more than enough to take you through. Can I hear an amen out of that? Larry, can I have my mustard seed? There it is. Can you see that little seed up there? You know, it doesn't take much faith. Do you realize that? Just a little, he said, if you, you can move mountains with a mustard seed. Wow. Give me my next mustard seed. I like that one. See that little, can you, that's the thumb, I mean the, the, the finger and the little seed sitting up there. And this is for me as much as you. Most of us try to grow a forest in one day. I've tried to grow a lot of forest in one day. However, I invite you. Jesus, however, invites you to begin with a tiny seed. Watch it grow and wait for it to become all that you dream it would be. And somewhere in that depth of that mustard seed faith, you find sufficient grace. You find strength to help you through your most difficult times. You find a God who understands what you're going through. You find a God that will never leave you, that will never forsake you. And you'll boldly say, the Lord is your helper, and you shall not fear. But you see, as we wait upon God, we need to wait with expectancy. We need to have the faith that says there's nothing impossible with my God. Amen? And you know what? This could be the year. This could be the season that he returns. Can you imagine that? Wow. Can you imagine here we are, marching to the end of 2016, 2017, setting on the horizon. And yet, it could be the season. It could be the time. But we need to allow God to touch our lives. Think about this, and I'll close with this. We wait for the baby, and we dream of holding it in our arms. Sometimes we're waiting for a prodigal son to come home and to end his rebellion and return to the fold. Some are waiting maybe for a phone call to say a bad situation has turned good, information about a test, or we're waiting for God to open our eyes and touch us spiritually and give us grace. But the key is that we wait with expectancy, that we wait with confidence that God 
will be right on time. Amen? Let's stand together this morning. And here's, I can only imagine, are you willing to plant this little mustard seed today? Plant it in your heart and wait with God's expectancy that God will move and work in your life. That's all it starts. There's a little seed, just a little bitty seed. And say, God, plant that in my heart. And I'm going to wait upon God with expectancy to allow him to do his sufficient grace in my life. Let's pray together. Father, we wait upon you. You're the answer. You're the reason for the season. You're our strength. You're our hope. And so, Father, I pray that you would touch our hearts, spark a a little spark in our lives, a mustard seed of faith that would stir expectancy, that would stir faith, that would stir trust in us to say you are the way and you're the answer. I thank you for it, Father God. And Father, I pray that as we go through this Christmas season, that we'll go through trusting, leaning on you, and allowing you to work in our lives as only you can. Father, we give you praise and we put our trust in you and we commit our lives to you this morning. And we ask your guidance, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen and amen. This, uh, uh, this do my, Larry, can I do my song as we end, Trading My Sorrows? His, what I want to do, I love that little song. It's got such a snappy little thing. But here's what I'd like for you to do. Just sing it one more time, okay? But this make an exchange as we do it today. Whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're facing, trade it in. Amen? And say, I, 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 I'm trading my son. I'm trading my pain. I'm trading my distress, whatever it may be. Are you ready, Larry? Okay, I'll, I'll dim the lights and we'll do it. Stand on up. We have two hand motions for you. A thumbs up is a yes, and an L shape with your hands is Lord.
good trade, amen? You know, and make that decision as you leave here. You know, trade it to the Lord. Allow God to work His sufficient grace and allow God to be your strength as you deal with the issues, amen? Fair enough, exchange, amen? And aren't you glad His grace is always sufficient? And no matter what we're going through, no matter how difficult it may be, God's grace is always sufficient. Well, hug somebody around you and uh, tell them you love them in Jesus and you're dismissed.